Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jerry Burgess, Professor of Environmental Science and Studies here at Johns Hopkins. And it's really my pleasure to welcome you all today for our latest installment of The Business of Saving the Planet. I think we, we were all pretty aware that the environmental field is broad and deep and, and really replete with opportunities for our graduates. But, but in recent years, we've seen the rise of sustainability issues that permeate throughout the public, private, and governmental sectors. For example, acronyms like ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Investing, is, is often used to evaluate and encourage companies to act responsibly. Now, more broadly, over the past couple of decades, a high-level corporate position has evolved that is still something of a mystery to many of our current students and alumni and society at large. As companies have engaged in more efforts around the environment, sustainability, the the chief sustainability officer, the CSO, is being created to champion and monitor these and, and other efforts. And we've got three such leaders for our seminar today. In fact, it is their business to save the planet, as it were. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Scott Atkinson. Scott is a proud Hopkins alumni, and he's a partner in Hydric and Struggle San Francisco office and co-lead of the Global Sustainability Practice. Um, he places chief executives, board directors, uh, chief sustainability officers, and other social impact initiatives uh, around the world. Scott is also um, on the governance council for groups like the Jane Goodall Foundation, and he is a real champion for a variety of environmental issues. With that introduction, I'd like to welcome Scott Atkinson. Scott, they're all yours. Dr. Burgess, you always bring such great energy to these discussions. Thank you for the nice introduction. And a big hello to everyone out there in the audience for joining us. We're really excited and grateful for your participation today. And, uh, today in episode six, we have the opportunity uh, to talk with leading sustainability officers from some top companies, including Apollo Global Management, Netflix, Rivian, we will have the opportunity to explore how they are embedding impact outcomes within their respective businesses and hear how and why they chose their professional paths. What I find particularly interesting about corporate sustainability leadership today, while there are some commonly shared aspects of the job across the function, uh, in reality, no two chief sustainability officers are doing exactly the same thing. And that's because what is material to their respective businesses are different. Reporting structures are different. Uh, you'll hear this variation from our panelists. And frankly, that gives me comfort because there's no one way to positively impact and influence the world. And we need help and leadership from a diversified swath of companies and industries in order to help solve the climate crisis. And our hope, our, our panelists and John, at Johns Hopkins, is that this discussion helps you, our audience, as you think through what your legacy of leadership is going to be. What do you wanna do with your time on earth? Uh, what issues get you excited to lift your head, head off the pillow every day? And it could be working in a sustainability function, like our panelists, or it could be building your own business or uh, organization that's taking on some of, some of these central issues. Our format today, it, I'm going to pose three uh, questions to our panelists related to what they're doing. And then we're gonna turn it over to you, the audience for questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to write in the chat. We're gonna do our best to get to each question. Um, and with that, let's jump in. Our first panelist, Emma Stewart, sustainability officer at Netflix, is working to bring the company's carbon footprint to net zero, raise awareness through their films and television content, um, engage uh, their millions of members on climate and environmental change. And she is an absolute force. I think if you were to go around to this panel and to most chief sustainability officers, they will know her by name and reputation. And she's also a true advocate and um, authentic leader in this space and someone that frankly, I go to with I'm on. Emma, it's so great to have you. Thank you again for joining us. And I, the first question that I wanted to pose to all the panelists, but we'll start with you is, 
tell us about what you do at Netflix. What's the day to day? What are some of the goals that you and your team are focusing on? I won't be um, shy about interjecting with specific questions, but hand it over to you. To That's such a nice introduction. Thank you, Scott. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with old friends like Dave and new friends like Anissa. Um, a sustainability officer's day is a, an exercise in utilizing all of your gray matter. I like to joke that from one meeting to the next, I am code switching and I'm literally changing hemispheres of my brain. Um, just to give you an example, I started today with a 7 a.m. meeting um, for the directorate of uh, BAFTA, which is the British Film and Television Association. It's one of the most influential uh, industry groups in the entertainment sector. We were talking about what the next 10 years looks like in terms of their sustainability program, which is really um, world leading. Then uh, a meeting on uh, scope three emissions factors for clothing, <laughs> really down in the weeds, uh, together with members of my team and the internal audit group. Um, you know, consulting uh, next on a, a top secret title I can't divulge, uh, unfortunately, to you today. Uh, so that's a creative consultation with the creative executives and their writers about how sustainability topics can show up both accurately and authentically in uh, their storyline. Uh, and you know, that will take a while to, to hit the Netflix service, but we're hoping that the volume of consultations that we're doing uh, manifests in a real diversity uh, and quality of sustainability stories on the service. Uh, I then have a, a pol public policy sync. Um, we, we talk with our public policy teams across a range of key countries on a very regular basis. Um, so not just here in the United States at the federal and state level, but um, being a, a company that operates in so many countries, we have regulations that are relevant to us or could be relevant to us. And so we work hand in glove with our public policy team. Um, we have this external uh, speaking engagement, which there's a real curiosity about this role, I can assure you. And so we get a lot uh, of speaking engagement invitation. Um, then I'll meet with one of our scientific advisors who we have on our external advisory group. And then I need to review a number of marketing assets that we're putting out with members of top talent who are really interested in these topics and if their title touches on these topics, even in the most gentle way, they're often keen um, to talk about them through social assets. So our marketing team uh, works, works to deliver on that aspiration. So it's, it's such a mix um, and that's what keeps me on my toes. So in one day, if I'm thinking, if I'm hearing you correctly, Emma, you're touching and, and, and partnering and being a translator in many ways for uh, board level leadership, uh, you mentioned audit. So the finance, financial officer team, uh, policy, production. I mean, so it, it's, uh, I, I mean, I, I would assume that a big part of your job is being a cross-functional partner and strategist. Is, has that always been the case? Because I know that you, you, uh, you know, spent a fair amount of your, your time in this role at Autodesk and other companies, but I'm curious if you're seeing a shift in how broad you're going over the last couple of, couple of years. Good question. I mean, one of my first phone calls when I was at Autodesk was to the head of public policy, and I said to him, hi, my name's Emma, and I want to make sure that you're not lobbying against me. <laughs> and we, we became fast friends after that, and we did a lot of walking the hill together. Um, but I was aware because I had consulted for many companies before that uh, at BSR, which is I know, where I know Dave from, that often the public policy team was completely disconnected from what the sustainability team was doing. And sometimes the right hand was actively working against the left hand. So, um, but to answer your broader question, I'm always conscious that uh, you can't just knock on the door and say, I should be in this meeting because we are sustainability and you need us. You have to prove your worth. You have to make yourself indispensable to those functions so that they want you in those uh, conversations and as early as possible, right? Whether it's designing a new facility or advising on a script, the later you get involved, generally the worse the outcome 
uh, from a sustainability integration standpoint and generally also from a financial standpoint. So having it be top of mind for people and having them keen to invite your input as opposed to viewing it as some sort of uh, meddling or prescription or top-down mandate has always been the way I've, I've tried to operate. And so sometimes that means just bringing general intelligence about the business, not even sustainability intelligence. And one of the benefits of roles like Dave and Issa's and mine is that we are so cross-functional. There actually aren't that many people other than maybe um, you know the CEO and a couple folks reporting to that person who have that breadth of exposure. Uh, and so we can help people see the connections, be that connective tissue, and hopefully act as that trusted advisor. Last uh, follow-up question I have before I go to Anissa. What I find particularly unique about your role is the, the sustainability team in, in some way, shapes or forms, help support creators who want to better represent sustainability on screen. Um, in fact, the last time you and I spoke, I called you right after I, I was watching the Super Bowl and the commercial Will Ferrell came out and I said, oh my God, I had no idea that you were involved in that. Can you speak a little bit about that aspect of the role? Because I, I do think that's super unique to what you're doing. I did joke with my team that in a 20 year sustainability career, I never in a million years thought I would be helping write a Super Bowl ad. But I guess that's when you know you've hit the mainstream. Um, and so that just on that note, you know, we worked over a year internally and quite quietly uh, to integrate more electric vehicles as picture cars, as they're called, meaning they're on screen. Uh, and we did that through uh, the production management executives, we're trying to encourage them to make those vehicles available and then simultaneously encourage the creative executives that this could be part of their storyline it need not be any uh, disruption uh, to their process and that it would be authentic. So for example, a period piece, you might not have an electric vehicle. In the Super Bowl ad, if you've seen it with Will Ferrell, we kind of make fun of ourselves by saying, we wouldn't put it in Bridgerton, we wouldn't put it in Stranger Things. Um, and so we talked more about the exception than the rule uh, and hopefully that, that comedic angle worked. But that's the sort of thing where our brand marketing team was really leading on how do we uh, execute against this uh, brand level campaign. But my team was advising them on what is legitimate for us to say and claim and what is the future of the electrification of transportation. And therefore, how much is this really leadership versus uh, simply reflecting reality? And then we also supported the production management team and getting the electric vehicles um, that we needed, and then we supported the creative team in helping them th think through, you know what, it's not all Teslas. There's Rivian. There's there's a whole host of other forms of electric vehicles now. And so if you've seen Murder Mystery 2, one of our recent popular films, there's a hilarious scene with Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston in this tiny little electric Citroen. Um, and that was intentional, right? Uh, it was intentionally funny. So we got questions like, are we allowed to crash these electric vehicles? <laughs> and, and those were moments when we thought, oh, are you? Yes, I think you are. I think the goal is, is to just normalize this, not to, to, to make it seem overly noble. Um, so those are examples of when I find myself kind of pinching myself, here we are, we're writing a, a Super Bowl ad. I think sustainability has arrived. I think I, I read in your most recent uh, sustainability report that uh, more than 70% of Netflix members goes to watch at least one story on Netflix that help better help them better understand climate issues and highlight hopeful solutions around sustainability. And when you're talking about, you know, 165 million households around the world, that is a true platform for change. And it's amazing that you and your role have an opportunity to, to, to play part of that. I'm gonna shift really quickly to uh, our second panelist, Anissa Costa, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer for Rivian. She is responsible for their sustainability roadmap, uh, both for their the business and their products. And she also leads Rivian Forever, which is the philanthropic mission that includes Rivian's foundation. Um, uh, she comes to the company with over two decades uh, spent at Tiffany and Company. And uh, again, delighted to have you with us, Anissa. 
Um, for those of you that don't know Rivian, I, I do, because I was able to test drive one of the, the trucks and it's amazing. Uh, Rivian designs, develops and manufactures category defining electric vehicles. And uh, Anissa, we'd, we'd love, you know, we, we joked about this. You're at a, a very entrepreneurial company right now and certainly a shift for you, but, but same question, would love to hear a little bit about your day to day and what are your team's goals and what are your ta you test with currently? Well, first of all, Scott, thank you again for the invitation. I'm so thrilled to be here and I'm really looking forward to the, the broader conversation that the four of us are going to have and to the questions that are, that are going to come our way from the audience. Um, I have to say that everything that Emma just spoke to, I was like, check, 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 check. It all rings absolutely true. Um, this role for me, and I would say both here at Rivian and previously at Tiffany and Company is really in the best sense of the word, an exercise in agility. Um, it is all about breath, but also depth. And, um, or at Rivian, we, we talk about zooming in and zooming out, right? So it is everything from, we just had our planet and policy committee meeting of our board of directors, which is effectively our version of an ESG committee. Um, and actually I liked what you said, um, Emma, in terms of making sure that policy is connected. So hopefully that's a, that's a good nod to the way um, this committee was structured. Um, but moving from, um, you know, governance, matters like that at the board level to our ESG steering committee, which I co-chair, it's a, a, a structure we just set up, which I co-chair with our CFO and our general counsel to working not just with my uh, small but formalized team, but other teams um, throughout the company. And of course, externally, right? The, the external, st external stakeholder engagement component um, is one of the, the joys of this work. Um, whether it's internal and external, and just the ability to interact day in and day out with a, a wide variety of actors and people and institutions at a you know on a global scale at multiple levels is so important. And it's not always what I love too is that while I'm um, while oftentimes right like my me and my team we we are subject matter experts right. This is a space where everyone is an expert in different ways. Anissa, can you share with us uh, maybe one or two uh, pieces that you're working on right now that you're particularly pretty, um, with, uh... Yes. So we are in the process right now of standing up our first set of enterprise-wide sustainability goals. Um, this is something that's critically important, I think, to, to any company, but especially where Rivian is currently, right? We're newly public. We went public at the end of 2021. Um, there's so many elements that are um, going to hit public companies. Although frankly, I'm a believer that whether you're public or private, right? Transparency of disclosure, thinking about things within the same framework is really important. But what my team and I are working on is co-creating, and I use that word intentionally, these enterprise-wide sustainability goals along with our peers internally and effectively our peers externally as well. So we're building the business case for those now. They're um, being vetted internally um, before they go to the board for final approval and before they're released externally. Um, and I think um, I think that that's been a really interesting process for a company that is moving very fast, right? And the the near term is very much on our mind, but we have this really purpose built vision that RJ Scaringe, our founder, sort of created the company with. And it's really important to us that we have that North Star and that we're able to think far enough in the future so that we can continu continuously innovate. And we want to be part of those creative energizing solutions. The other thing that I should just mention, um, because it's really important to us, is that we are setting up and launching our foundation, which was funded with 1% of pre-IPO stock. And um, I do think that philanthropy, while it is not sustainability, it is a key lever in a company's uh, portfolio, if you will, and its toolbox in terms of how it can operate and how it can fund and empower other or help you know bring to the table other actors that are critical to this space and to the space evolving and growing. I think that's another, the fact that you have oversight and responsibility for the philanthropic mission as well is, is another piece that's unique to you, Anissa. Not every company is structured that way. 
right? Sometimes we see this bifurcation of, I'm gonna have oversight for the sustainability roadmap that might you know, have focus on the business and the products uh, or oversight for ESG reporting, um, which is, a, you know, it's, it's um, uh, synergistic and has overlap with uh, corporate philanthropy, but in some ways those, you know, those items are, are uniquely different, right? So just one call it again, which is as we're looking at the chief sustainability officer function, uh, it varies and and it's a common theme of, of what response in, uh, in, in which doesn't. And it's so very um, Maybe I'll add move. just one other yeah, thing, just that I think, you know, we know first and foremost, what the impact that we make via the pure business lines in our supply chain, that is first and foremost, and that's critical. But I do think to your point, having this other lever is a really solid way to make sure we're thinking cross-functionally and about the total impact of the company. And I just wanted to mention one other thing, because it, it reminds me of something that you and Emma touched on earlier. And that is one thing that we really try to do is to make sure that comms that legal and of course finance are at the table every step along the way. I mean, specifically with the goals, but just in general, right? Because there's nothing worse than uh, getting to the end. And Emma, you said uh, getting to the end and then having sustainability come in. And but similarly, like working on something with three quarters of the partners, and then you know, comms comes in and and wants to you know adjust the the language in a way that doesn't quite make sense, for example. So that's something I think that probably all of us are practicing day in and day out. And only more increasing going forward, I'm sure. Um, I want to move to our third, and thank you, Anissa. I want to move to our third panelist, uh, last but not least. In fact, I said, Dave, and I should back up. Any one of, of the three of you could be your own keynote. And we're so fortunate to have these three, three leaders on our, on our panel. I asked Dave if he wouldn't mind going last, um, purely because what Dave does is so different at Apollo just by uh, way of background, Dave is the chief sustainability officer at Apollo, uh, which is a large asset manager, um, highly respected. Previously, he was the chief sustainability officer at Campbell's Soup, where he created and led the company's ESG, corporate citizenship, and uh, sustainability and public affairs strategies. Uh, before that, he was at Intel. Uh, he also serves on the board of the Ag Funder Network and uh, was just sharing with us that he was a guest lecturer at Babson. We'll get him over to Johns Hopkins at some point. Um, and uh, Dave, thank you for joining us. Same, same question, would love to hear a little bit about what you're doing and the nuances between, you know, uh, maybe what we heard from Emma and Anissa given your time at Campbell versus what you're tasked with today. Yeah, thanks Scott. It, it's great to be here. It's great to ke catch up with my, my old friends and, um, and these conversations are always fun. And I think there's, you know, for those that are online, that there's obviously lots of threads and similarities. And um, I think the one kind of clear takeaway, even in this first round, is that these roles are clearly different from a content perspective, right? Based on companies, based on sectors, there's a lot of similarities in terms of what we're doing from, you know, kind of change management, agility, kind of integration. But we all three have completely different roles and we go about our jobs in different ways. At, at Apollo, I was, you know, kind of as you both were talking and reminiscing, I missed that part. I remember working on an ad when I was at Campbell Soup Company and doing green, you know, video shoots and stuff. But I'm not doing any of that here. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Apollo, it is a, it is a publicly traded company um, that manages, think of it as, you know, basically managing private capital. So it invests in almost everything that is in a public stock or a public bond um, all over the world. Um, there's 500, about $550 billion under management. So that's about the, the amount of money we invest. A big portion of that is in what we call credit or yield. And if you're not familiar with the, the sector, it's literally loans and debts and capital to let companies grow and invest and do other things where they need capital and they don't go to a, a regular bank. Um, the other parts of the business are focused on you know, private equity, which most people kind of understand. And that's what they think the whole firm is sometimes, but that is investments in specific companies, right? And um, you know, we've made investments in specific companies 
more than 350 companies that we've either invested in or owned over the course of the, the firm's history. Our next report that goes out will include, you know, subsets of basically sustainability reports from about 80 companies that we're kind of involved in. And that's not even the whole universe. And then the other split of that is kind of the rest, like these things we call hybrid or real assets, real estate. Um, so it's a very complex business. It's it's literally like going back to school in a very intense um, program for me, which is one of the things I was looking for. I mean, I was I was not um, I was doing a bunch of consulting before for a couple of years. I was consulting with a bunch of large public companies because that's what I enjoy and that's how I can help. And Apollo reached out and I, I asked him like four times, are you sure? Like, is this the right person? Like, are you, I'm not sure you're looking for me. You know, I'm happy to find somebody else. And um, I give them credit. They really are, you know, trying to bring in operators in a few places where they know they need them. Um, so what I'm doing is I've been there about a year and a half and I'm tasked with, again, first kind of the first CSO here to build the structure, the management systems, the processes, the integration so that Apollo can live into the future it wants to be in, right? So that is, it changes every day, right? The, the demands of investors, what we call limited partners or, you know, family offices, sovereign funds, pension, you know, pension funds from states or countries, universities, um, want to invest their dollars in certain ways. They have criteria, they have expectations for reporting. Um, they, you could call it ESG, but they have expectations for reporting on a lot of things um, that we can talk about if, if there's interest. Um, but there's that, plus there's also the regulatory framework as a publicly traded company that issues basically financial products around the world. Those financial products are, the firm is regulated. We're, we're, we're a mix of an asset manager and literally an insurance company that many people may not know. And this works out really well from a financial perspective because Insurance returns are set, they're locked in, they have fairly low costs of capital, and we can invest that capital at a very high return and make everybody happy. It's a nice mix, um, but it's a very complicated thing to try to describe and wrap your head around. Um, food was complicated, tech was complicated, this is an order of magnitude more complicated. But basically creating teams that then help drive this strategy in that private equity business. There's, now there's four people over there, and they work with companies to make companies better, kind of like what we all talk about. But we work with our portfolio companies and we help them, we provide them tools. Um, we work with leaders, CEOs and board members. There's a group of people that are focused on the credit side of the business. This is different, it's fast moving. Um, many more investments, thousands of investments that are, that are scored and we're looking for, we're looking to do better due diligence, basically better risk management and turn that into value on that side. Lots of reporting, lots of in, lots of engagement and stewardship, kind of tracking what we're doing so that we can report out to LPs and investors. You know, what's what's in my portfolio? What's it doing over time? What are the issues in there? And this is all 100% um, of this work is to drive increased returns and better value for our investors, right? And doing it in an ethical way, doing it in a transparent, incredible way. But these are conversations I'm having all the time in the firm because this shorthand language we use to describe what we do, whether it's ESG or sustainability, is not helpful. It, it, I don't think it's helpful. I think it 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 people have a connotation, and um, more and more so, they might have you know completely divergent con you know connotations of what ESG means. Like it's the, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and you can't do that. Like we don't want that anymore um, for some reason. So being very precise on how we build this and how we kind of extend it. And in the center, we have an impact fund where there's, you know, they are focused on driving either social or environmental metrics. There's lots of great stuff going on over there. We've got public commitments around clean transition or climate investing, 50 billion by 2027, 100 billion by 2030. So a lot of work and effort in building our own taxonomy, our own decision-making criteria about clean investments or transition investments. Really lots of fun and it, it's it, the, the intellectual stimulation is sometimes a little bit overwhelming. You know, it keeps me up at night, um, but that's okay. That's what we're in this role for. But it literally is building out these teams in the center is where we do our reporting, both for enterprise, but also things like principles for responsible investment, you know, managing rankings and ratings. So I have a climate lead on my team, 
several legal people because the, the legal environment is really complex, not only in the US, but a lot of effort um, making sure that we are on top of everything happening in, in Europe. Um, but I would say that there's the PE part of the business is probably the closest what most people would kind of think about, like working with companies, helping companies be more sustainable, you know, sustainable, that's happening over there. I would be, thanks, Dave. I'd be shocked if we didn't get a question in and around ESG uh, broadly and, and the myth is around it. If you were to think, I mean, you've been there for two and a half years. If you were to think about, you know, what you're most proud of, of achieving, whether it be, you know, work around energy transition or work around that topic or, you know, being the translator around ESG topics from a legal risk um, opportunity standpoint, like what, what would you point to? That yeah, it's been a, it's been a year and a half, and every oh, time we stop, I'm giving you too much credit, right? Every time we stop and take a breath, we we are literally my team. We just talked about this um, yesterday, and the day we are stunned about how much has gotten done. Like mm. there's great people, super smart people all across the firm, but just on the credit side alone, I mentioned in our kind of warm up, there's a credit ESG white paper. If anybody's really interested about what we built over the last 12 to 18 months in credit due diligence, identifying risk, creating value. We've re, that team has gone back and kind of rescored more than 3,000 credit investments. Um, they've enhanced the, the kind of the, the ability to do nuance in risk management, bringing more than 80 sector standards in. It, all of this has happened just in the last year and a half. Um, the climate commitment was, you know, that's a year old as of February 24th. All of that work is is relatively new. We've the firm has launched new SFDR products, which are you know there's an infrastructure fund that is regulated under SFDR, and there's a whole kind of whole like system behind the scenes that is a challenge to get that done. On the private equity side, they've we've set new targets for um, carbon reduction across our next flagship fund. We've set new targets for supplier diversity that we exceeded, and then set new targets board diversity targets, some equity ownership partnerships in the companies that we invest in on the portfolio company side. First time we've done TCFD reporting. First time we've done any finance emissions work on some of our portfolios. Um, it's just, you know, it's mind boggling. A lot. And we, we have to literally stop and take a breath and like recognize the team because it's hard work. And mm. some, of, some of the things you see and hear in the press today, you know, our the the earlier talent, a lot of I think a lot of what we probably do, I, I don't want to speak for Emma or, or Anissa, but we're also managing morale of leaders, right? Of, I mean, I met with my I met we have a sustainability and corporate responsibility committee at our board of directors, and I meet with them every quarter. And I less met with them in person last Thursday, and I brought in a younger, you know, earlier career person. I met, we talked about reporting. We talked about rankings and ratings. We talked about the environment that we're operating in. And from a financial firm, how much more precise we need to be in. We, we just, we can't throw terms around like impact, ESG, and sustainability. We have to be very specific, um, both when we're having conversations like this, but especially in, you know, fund documents, marketing materials, and external communications. Well, congratulations on all that you've achieved in that short period of time. I thought it was two and a half years, not a year and a half. Gosh. Sometimes it feels like two and a half years, but no, it's not <laughs> a year. I bet. Thanks, Dave. So um, we're going to go around the horn with one question, one more question before we open it up to the audience. And it's it's my favorite question. It's more of the personal uh, uh, piece of this. But um, for those of you in the audience, uh, feel free to... Um, reach out to us via chat and ask us questions. After this round, we're gonna we're gonna dive into what the top line do. And the, the question, and Emma, I'll I'll go back to you. It is what can help you to get into this line of work? I mean, I know you have a PhD in environmental science policy and management. Not everybody seeks that out and then decides to get into you know corporate world. I'm just curious about personally why why enter into this profession. Can I bring some show and tell? You got it. Whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> so I just discovered this the other day among uh, some artifacts from my youth. This is a book. Let's see if it can we, can, we can't see it. 
dinosaurs and all that rubbish it's called and when i opened it to read it with my children i had these very strong memories and i realized that i think this is the book that started my career <laughs> um it's all about these dinosaurs realizing how trash the earth has become and there's a fellow uh who decides forget it you know let's look for planet b and he flies off to the moon and he looks back and he, he says, well, that star looks nice, let's go there. And he flies back and he lands and because he's left, the earth has replenished itself. Um, you know, in our, our great national park series with President Barack Obama, he likes to say, give nature space and she will revitalize. Uh, and so he returns to earth and he thinks he's found this other planet that is heaven. And then he realizes, oh, <laughs> this is Earth. I'm back on my original home planet. And I just needed to give it some, some breathing room, quite literally. So from a very early age, I thought that humans were being a little short-sighted um, by steadily destroying the systems upon which we survive, literally the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink. And I remember staring out my window and thinking, this seems really ill-advised, but I don't know what to do about it. And so in um, middle school, I founded an environmental club and applied for my first grant um, to the United Way. It was quite intimidating, um, but we got the grant and I'm told that that club still exists, which is remarkable decades later, but I never in a million years thought that I could apply that passion and that realization to my profession um, until I got into university and saw the potential. And there were no degrees in this at the time. Uh, you know, this was in the 90s. Uh, the term sustainability didn't exist. Um, so I was doing genetics and statistics and economics and these other sciences. Um, but the realization dawned on me actually in the Western forest of Brazil, the lesser known Brazil, a Brazilian forest um, called the Atlantic Forest was that, hang on, if I'm trying to relocate endangered species to keep them alive because their forest is being fragmented, I could either continue studying mitochondrial DNA or I could go talk to McDonald's because it's beef that and ranching that is fragmenting the forest that is decimating this population. And so I went way upstream. And that took me to the corporate sector, which again at BSR, BSR had figured this out, WBCSD had figured this out. Climate wasn't really on the radar as it should have been. And so that's how I got into the, the field was realizing that it's in the interest of humanity and it's in the interest of business to be smarter as to how we run our organizations and how we incentivize ourselves and structure our economy. Um, but the art of doing that well and successfully in ways that drive business value was still being ironed out. That's amazing. What's the title of the book again, Emma? Uh, it's a British book, Dinosaurs and All That Rubbish. Dinosaurs and All That Rubbish. I'm going to put it on the reading list for my kids. <laughs> we, we currently are reading Hugo and the Impossible Thing. I have to give it a shout out. It's basically about Hugo, this little dog that lives in a forest and... Um, is continually told by all the other forest animals, you can't reach the impossible thing because no one's done it before. And he just says, well, I'm gonna go do it. And the, the tail end is he ends up collaborating. Great, great, great book, it's my favorite. Uh, Anissa um, and Emma, thank you for making that so personal and sharing, we, we appreciate it, it's, it's inspiring. Um, Anissa, same question, what compelled you to get into this field? So I had always been interested in sort of the intersection of multiple sectors and actors to come together for positive change. But when I was in school, similarly, there wasn't, this field didn't exist certainly the way it does now. So I didn't know that this existed. I didn't know what that was. Um, and I like dealing both with global issues, but also sort of at the, at the micro community level. So I ended up getting my master's in international affairs um, at SIPA, not SAIS, um, but SAIS is an amazing program at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, and basically from there, what, what I what I took away from that, right, was this, it's this multidisciplinary set of studies, right? You're really 
pulling together from finance and economics, environmental studies, human rights. I mean, it was basically, to me, the most perfect degree one could have going into this field, except I didn't know that that I would go into this field. So I ended up working briefly in banking, which again, I think that having that background is really helpful given, um, and Dave, you touched on this, sort of the need for exactness. I think that that's something that's becoming increasingly important here. Um, and, um, but, but then, you know, I was missing sort of dealing with the policy issues that I studied in school. I was missing, um, I, or I was yearning for more interaction, right, with a, a wider um, set of actors. And so I ended up um, uh, moving over to work for one of the Rockefeller family foundations, private family foundations. And it was an amazing sort of space, again, to be able to interact with a number of players, um, both nonprofit, but otherwise, again, in a, in a wide variety of fields, ranging from environment to the arts, um, to education. And again, I think that this space, again, is about constantly, um, yes, I think at the core, there's there's environmental and social, but you've got to be able to understand all the interdependencies and how the world fits together so that we, we can create that positive impact. And then I you know, actually met the, the now former chairman and CEO of Tiffany and Company, who was really ahead of his time. And he was, we were sort of extremely like-minded and he was like, all right, like come over and let's build this together. And that was at this point over two decades ago, as you mentioned, I spent um, two decades there building up um, both the sustainability and philanthropy work. And it's been so gratifying and it's been really nice to see the, the pace and the evolution of the change. And I wanted to mention one other thing because you guys, Dave touched on this, but, and I've thrown around a few terms, sustainability, ESG for Rivian, much like a Tiffany, sustainability is the environmental and the social as opposed to simply environmental sustainability. But I do think it would behoove the field, frankly, if we aligned on terminology, because some firms, some companies call it corporate responsibility, some sustainability, meaning just environmental, some sustainability, meaning broader. So I guess I just sort of throw that out there to everyone, because I think it would um, benefit the work if we were using the same terminology. Yeah, I'll, I'll just second that, Anissa. Just, and part of me wonders, as we have more standardization in the field, whether it be with the uh, SEC climate regulations that are coming out or EU regulatory standards, wonder, and Dave's is doing one of these, I, I wonder if there will be there will be more uniformity. We'll we'll see, but I I agree with you. I think it would help uh, the field um, uh, overall. Thank you for for sharing that, Dave. Um, same question. Yeah, I'll try to keep this short. But I think that the to go to your last point, I do think there there's going to be more specificity about what we're actually doing, right? I think that's the thing. I don't think there's going to be alignment on what companies call this, but if they're focusing on kind of factors that are dealing with the environment, natural capital, you know, physical risks and from what they're going to be talking about that, I think. I think that's that's one of the outcomes that we're seeing in this space. Um, I feel a little bit for the audience that's watching this thinking, all right, so what is the path to these jobs? And I'm not going to help because mine is completely different than, than Emma and Anissa. And um, I'm the business, like I was the kid in seventh grade that would read the Wall Street Journal every morning when I had my you know, three donuts at the time and I could eat like that for breakfast. Um, always interested in business, but my what I found easy as a student was science and technology. So I'm a biochemist. I have a master's in occupational environmental health and all of these kind of after my undergraduate degree and literally my undergraduate degree was like, I thought I was going to go to work in medicine. I got an internship at Ford Motor Company in, in Dearborn, Michigan, which I grew up. That's why I think I should be a Rivian. And, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, not right. At, not right at the moment. I'm 100 percent, you know, 200 percent committed to Apollo. Um, but I love the auto space. I still am a, I'm a hardcore kind of automotive person. And uh, is, is checking that off on things to <laughs> do mind for Dave. Yeah. Come on over, um, Dave. The more the merrier. No, absolutely. Like I said, I you know you can leave Detroit, but you don't take Detroit out of a person. Um, so all my schooling was in Detroit and I was working. And literally I kept going to school because every job I had, I thought, well, I now I need to be a little bit more on, you know, I need to focus on like occupational health and safety. I worked at Ford Motor Company. They said go take more chemistry. I took more chemistry. Um, that seemed to help me get the next job. And I was doing like health and safety and big, you know, manufacturing firms in Michigan. So I got an occupational environmental health degree, certified in industrial hygienist, certified safety professional. 
Um, I figured I'm doing business. I like business. I'll go to business school. So I got an MBA. I actually applied and got accepted to law school because I was like basically working out of the two CFRs, 29 and 40 for these bids. I, I might as well go to law school. Um, but I was trying to get out of Michigan. I'll make this show. I'll try to get this to the point. But um, went out to work in electric utility. But every job I had, like literally from the very first one, I'm like, we're, we're missing something. We're leaving value on the table. There's so much here from a reputation perspective. There's so much we can, every company, like we could be better, right? We can do things better. We could be more efficient. We can basically be a better company. And I, after a couple of years at this electric utility in Arizona, I was working in environmental health and safety, which was a, kind of the starting point. I went over to Intel Corporation and I really didn't even know what Intel was at the time, but I had that one guy over there said, hey, come on over here. And I'm like, all right, I'll give it a try. I was a safety engineer in their corporate office. And, um, but some of the skill sets that Anissa and Emma talked about, communications, translation, Intel was really complex. They were using some of the most complex chemistries on the planet and building these very complex things. And some communities around the world were saying, look, we're scared. Like, we don't know what's coming out of your stacks. We're afraid. Share owner resolutions were coming from friends of mine that are now friends of mine that I've had for 30 years. You know, Tim Smith, Eaton from Eaton Vance and Winslow, KLB. Um, you know, Walden Asset Management, these are people I still stay in touch with. And I want to talk to them um, because my Intel asked me to like do this, do this environmental reporting that they were doing in the 90s and help us with these stakeholders. They didn't call them stakeholders, but they were shareholder resolutions. And it, that I came back from that job, negotiated those shareholder resolutions away, built really good friendships and trust, trustworthy relationships. And I came back to Intel. I said, there's no, there, we, there's somebody here needs to have this job. Like we, it took me two years to create it. I had a supportive boss. Intel was a great culture, entrepreneurial, but literally I had to like go around and like convince the entire firm as a safety engineer that we needed a role on corporate responsibility. That kicked us off. We did it. It worked out great. And it just, it kept going from there. And every job is a new job, literally. Every day, if you haven't picked it up from Emma and Anissa, is a new job. That's what we love about these roles. We don't know what we're going to be doing. Like the next day we get up. Um, the world changes, the issues change, what's material, what's risky, what do we need to communicate, what reputation we're managing. It's different in every sector. Um, food, apparel, tech, you name it. Um, materials, right? I mean, conflict minerals, um, rare earth metals in that space, right? And, and responsible marketing and advertising and communications. That, that's how I find myself here. Um, and it, now it's a lot about change management. And kind of taking all those tools that we've learned and driving that change. Uh, thank you for going through that, Dave. And whether you're aware of it or not, your response dovetails with, and actually it's a perfect setup for one of our questions. I'm gonna jump into uh, some of the questions from the audience, because we're getting some great ones. Um, and I'll start with uh, Sanda Paul. And, and by the way, Emma, Anissa, Dave, as we get into this, feel free to jump in if you feel compelled. I'm not going to call any, any of you out. Um, but for, Sanda Paul asks, I'm curious to know how companies justify the financial implications of sustainable initiatives, given that most sustainable initiatives are likely to have indirect and long-term benefits, but fewer, no immediate benefits in sight, except maybe adhering to government inflation. Curious if any of you have thoughts on that. I do enjoy busting that myth. Um, yes, that's why I started there. Try to do so as often as um, the economic realities allow. Uh, so I'll give a couple examples. In the operations space, you know, an economist would tell you there's no such thing as a $20 bill lying on the sidewalk because someone would have picked it up. Turns out that is absolutely not true. Economics is theory. We're operating in business. There's tons of waste. So first port of call is work across the company to identify that waste, whether it be in the form of energy or refrigerants or you know, these very um, emissions correlated uh, sources. And then that helps with the earlier dynamic we talked about, about making yourself indispensable and getting invited into uh, the right rooms is, oh, wait, those, those guys just saved us some money and identified 
some upgrades and you know maybe we should get their take on this next project. So I always start with that, optimize um, first, uh, and that can be operational or that can be technological. And that's gonna buy you a little bit of economic latitude to invest into the newer technologies that still have an upfront premium. I agree with Sandra Paul in terms of it's always important to delineate the total life uh, cost or total cost of ownership as it's known of a given technology. And businesses don't typically do that well. Um, but the total cost of ownership of like an electric vehicle, as we were talking about earlier, is better than a combustion engine vehicle. But the upfront cost is still in most vehicle models a little bit higher. So that's an accounting question ultimately and how your financial department chooses to look at their cash flows um, and their you know, P&L. When there is that upfront premium, we as, as my department try and put some sweeteners in place to ensure that without any form of prescription or mandate, the business is availing themselves of those technologies and at least trying them out so that they can see the operational and the qualitative benefits, even if there is an upfront premium. So we do try and smooth out that upfront premium for them initially. And then once they try out the cleaner technologies like batteries or fuel cells in lieu of diesel generators or electric vehicles in lieu of diesel trucks, they tend to like them better uh, and so then it becomes a question of, well, who pays uh, if there is that upfront cost? So that's on the operational side. And then on the, on the storytelling side, you know, we, with very little money, can make a title, so a, a film or, or, or television series, more conversation worthy by drawing out some of the very societally salient uh, sustainability themes in it. Uh, Unstable is a good example of that with with Rob Lowe, comedy series, um, you know, we helped that team with their campaign, make sure that it was as buzzy as possible. Um, and that is very, very low cost. It's essentially just marketing. And you don't hear marketing's budget being questioned, right? There's an assumption that marketing is good for the bottom line. And so in those instances, we're simply dovetailing off of that assumption. Dave, Anissa, any thoughts? All I would add, I mean, Emma lays it out perfectly, right? There's operational, there's reputational side, there's things that are longer term and shorter term. I do think this definitely varies by sector. I mean, at Campbell, we made some commitments and we were able to save hundreds of millions of dollars over the first five years on energy, water, waste, packaging, light weighting. Um, there's a definite, a different lens of um, fiscal and financial responsibility at the firm I'm at now in terms of the kind of investments, how long we hold them, what we're able to do, how we can help and the returns that our investors are expected to deliver. But this is all about value creation. But thinking about how your sector or company, number one, measures and derives value. Measures is one thing. Derives is probably even the more important thing, right? Like brand value for brands is valuable. And you can move that needle a lot without doing a lot, without spending a lot of money. You can spend money if you want. But every every firm, every company, every sector has its own, how does it define and how does it measure value? And knowing that lets you do your job. And that, yeah, there's some things that, you know, will not make that cut. The other thing I learned kind of in the C-suite at Campbell and now very clear at Apollo is, and it was an unknown for my first 20 years of my career. Like there's no free money. There, this resource allocation. Like if I want to invest in something on a sustainability perspective, I have to convince the person that holds the money to give it to me and not my head of supply chain or operations or marketing. Um, that's not the same in the philanthropic world, you know, when I had the foundation at, at Campbell, but I'm, it, that's the way it is in business. So it really is about driving value. And it doesn't always have to be a dollar this quarter, right? To Emma's point, it can be a little bit longer term. You just have to be able to des describe it. I like Dave's description of deriving value and there's qualitative and quantitative as was pointed out. Um, and then I would also say where a, a company is in its life cycle, right? So we are new, we're establishing new functions, which inherently has a different cost built in from the get-go, but again, will derive value over time. Uh, Santa Paul, thank you for that question. It was really good. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, a question for the three of you, what advice would you give, uh, and actually let me, let me pull out, um, 
specific question. This is from Ann, Annie. Um, what what individual what can individuals in scientific roles inside or outside academia uh, best inform and impact the industry? How can we better balance the scientific process with actionable information for decision making? Your role. I guess it's more of a how can science be a better partner to um, what you all are driving in the science. Happy to go first, but I realize I've been going first each time. So well, you are the scientist, Emma. So I give you license to take this one first. It's totally appropriate. Well, I again, I can only speak for myself on this one, but it seems self-evident that business operating in a physical reality, an economic reality, would want to understand the physical and natural sciences especially, you know, a resource intensive company, like, you know, a, a food company um, or a manufacturing company needs to understand their supply chain. Their supply chain is partially reliant on nature thriving. Um, so for me, steeping yourself in the science is part of the job. It doesn't mean you have to be in the journals every day. I'm only in the journals, you know, occasionally I have a large stack of them here on my desk, but I, keep scientists close to me so that they are apprising me of the latest. And so one way we did that was actually within the first few months of taking the position, creating this external advisory group. And it was unclear, Netflix had never done this before. They thought it was strange. Why, why do you need a scientific advisory group? Um, and it was so unclear how to set up the terms of reference for that. So what we went with was they're unpaid, but they're completely independent. Um, and we try not to ask too much of their time. These are busy people and their roles are really important uh, to the larger uh, society. So we can't be too precious about it. Um, but that independence is I think what attracted them to, to us and also the potential for impact. And so people like Dr. Catherine Hayhoe or Dr. Johan Rockström, these are some of the most effective scientists and communicators I've ever run into. And that, as someone who was trained in the sciences, hasn't traditionally been valued. The thought was, if you're good at communicating, I remember Jared Diamond was in my department at Stanford, and I will likely uh, annoy some people by saying this, but the other faculty ostracized him. And they did so, I think, because he had a best-selling book. Uh, same with Richard Dawkins, who was my professor in undergrad. These are people who are really good at their craft, their scientific in inquiry, but they're also excellent at communicating it in compelling and accessible terms. And they were ridiculed. Uh, in contrast, you see someone today like Dr. Catherine Hayhoe or Dr. Johan Rockström, there are documentaries about them. They're becoming rock stars because they're so good at both. And so that for me is what I would encourage Annie to think about is get, you know, world-class scientific inquiry skills, but always keep in mind, how is this applicable to a corporate practitioner and how can I help make this uh, evident to the stakeholders of that corporation so that the corporation can align itself to the science and execute against it and the general populace, whether that's the consumer or the policymaker or the investor um, can also understand that the company is operating within that scientific reality. That's great. Thank you, Dave. Anissa, you know, I don't know if you have any follow up points on how we can better balance the scientific process with actionable information. For this. Just, yeah, just a quick reaction. I think, you know, Emma touched on with this communications piece. I mean, science definitely helped me in my career especially at Campbell and, and Intel. Like the science that I had helped me you know, go in both those careers. But we serve, and I don't wanna speak for everybody, but I feel like we serve as translators and you know, no matter what it is. And, and we also help the firm see around corners, right? We're futurists, right? If for us to be successful, we have to predict the future. We have to be right sometimes. And use, you know, being able to take those skill sets, translate what's coming, if you're, especially if you're in, you know, a complex sector, science is critical 
depending on what you're doing, what you're manufacturing, where you operate. And, um, but you need to be able to communicate and that's a skill you can practice and learn. Um, so it's, it's always one to kind of try on, but translating and seeing around corners, I think are, you know, they're not listed in our job description, but that's a lot of what we do. A hundred percent. And Dave, to your point, we really are the canaries in a coal mine, right? Maybe that's not a great example, but we should be ahead sort of trying to signal like, what's the big shift that people haven't seen yet? Tiffany poses to Anissa, I'm curious if you have any sustainability goals involving elements of a particular model for your supply chain at Rivian. So we haven't released our goals yet. I'm, as I mentioned, we're, we're deep working on them, but circularity absolutely is a critical component of what we're focusing on. And frankly, I think it's of what any institution needs to focus on, what society needs to, to focus on. So um, in short, um, yes, incredibly, incredibly important. And Dave and Emma, I don't know if uh, circularity, you know, filters into any of your work, either, you know, for the portfolio companies or uh, for power, but um, Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, clearly in the, we actually used to, I mean, back in the, a long time ago, we talked about sand to sand in, in semiconductors and food is, there's a huge opportunity there. And I'm involved in a couple of startups around one on recycling, another one on upcycled food. Um, so there's lots of opportunity, to, again, depending on the sector. For us, it is in certain portfolio companies, right? Where either in our impact platform or in our private equity platform, um, we're thinking about that. We're looking at that as well. And, and some of the companies are doing it on their own. Like we don't, they don't even need us to kind of nudge them there. It's, their, it's in their business model, depending on their sector. Um, I'll jump into another question um, from Beth. Do your companies collaborate or partner with nonprofits focused on the environment slash sustainability? If so, what would be the criteria? Um, Beth, you want to All day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the criteria, and, and Dave alluded to this, each sector has its own specific needs. So they would need to be relevant to our sector. That said, we work with the likes of BSR, um, where I worked for a while, because they're so good at cross-training um, between sectors, and they're so good at industry-wide facilitation. Um, so they don't have to be real specialists in entertainment to bring good governance and process and decision-making and uh, voting rules to a group of companies. Um, we will sometimes proactively seek out a good contender from the nonprofit sector to help advance something that uh, either we or we and our peers need. We went out to Rocky Mountain Institute deliberatively to um, ask them about their technology incubator for um, a need we have, which is to dramatically scale up the supply of alternatives to diesel generators. No one seemed to be working on it. Um, and yet so many sectors would benefit from it, from construction to sports, to events, to military. And they have a real strong track record, both in the engineering uh, and the kind of technological breakthroughs. And then they also have done quite a bit of work in industry wide collaboration, like helping to spin off the clean energy. Um, Buyers Alliance and the Sustainable Aviation Buyers Alliance. So we sought them out. Um, so yes, I, I think the short answer is all day. It often helps to have a third party do the work and that allows for others to benefit from the fruits of those labors if it's a nonprofit um, mission organized, mission oriented organization. Sorry, Anissa, I, I cut you off. No, no, you didn't. I was just going to say similarly, all day, every day. And I maybe I would add both formally and informally, because I think there are sort of formal relationships and engagements. But one of the things that I love, and I'm sure it's the case for all of us, is that we're constantly day in and day out. Like our peers aren't just those of us on the screen, right? They're leaders in, in science at nonprofits, at, in academia, um, you know, in government. 
And um, so therefore that partnership, I would just say like really extends in every sense of the word to, to conversations like, what do you think? Um, again, in a formal way, right? Before we release our goals, we're going to be asking our, I would say peers. I don't, I also hesitate to use the word partnership all the time because to me, sometimes there's an imbalance that I think is worth acknowledging. Um, so I don't always use the word partnership, but I would just also use the word engage um, and engaging with a wide variety of stakeholders to understand where everyone is coming from, especially those that you um, maybe, I, again, I don't want to use the word disagree because I think it's not always that black and white, but I think that's the most important thing. It's the most interesting thing, the most engaging thing. And for me internally, it's useful to bring those different voices and perspectives inside to a company or a conversation or a room to help, to Dave's point, right? We're the communicators and the translators to help make sure that, you know, if they can't be in the room, how can I help to express that voice or even better, how can we bring them into the room formally? There are a few people asking about, uh, in a different way, this question, which is what advice would you give to audience members that are earlier on in their career currently in school thinking about how, you know, how do I, how do I uh, position myself to get into similar to, to yours? What did, you know, if you were looking at your, giving your, your own selves advice, uh, what, what would that, what would that be? All right, I'll start this time. Um, <laughs> This, this answer has changed over time. There's no doubt about it, right? I was involved with an organization called Vet Impact for many years and um, still involved a little bit, but much more involved in the past and working with students. And I still do a lot of um, where I can try to help. But the what I've seen play out, right? There's a little bit of a divergence in terms of the people that um, you know want to generally pivot. I, I like sustainability. I think I can do this role and I want to pivot into it. There's there's still opportunities for those people. Like there's lots of new companies coming in, and people are still getting hired as the first you know sustainability person. They may not be the CSO, but the big macro shift I've seen, and the one that is playing out kind of every day in the market is this specialization. And that that may not even be the right word. It's 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 more of a you know matching skill sets per the need of the company. A lot of these companies have been doing this for a while, or like Anissa, or I mean, they're building teams, or they're from scratch, or they're they're going into and, and you know working with an existing team, and the jobs. If you take a look broadly, there you'll see you know I need somebody in comms focused on sustainability, right? I need somebody in supply chain. The the two roles that are out there now that the the profession cannot find the talent for are reporting broadly and climate, either accounting or reporting. Um, and big companies, whether they're private or public, are working very hard to meet these external demands. And there is not talent in the marketplace. So these are, it's a little bit about what, what puzzle piece can I be in a company I love or a sector I love or a company versus I want to, I want, I want the whole puzzle and I want to do that on day one. And that's the shift I've seen. There's still the whole puzzles out there, but they're a little harder to find today than they were when, when we all started our careers. But um that's the advice I would be is learn as much as you can, learn, you know, learn the, learn the business, learn the sector, but try to pick one thing that you think you, you enjoy and try to dive a little deeper in it. Could be any of those examples. Could be philanthropy, could be comms, could be human capital. Yeah, that's the beauty these days is uh, Dave pointed to some specific roles that are being sought after now, but if you join the right company, everyone's role can be sort of have a sustainability component and you can sort of further accentuate it once you're there. There are just so many ways to approach this, but one of the pieces of advice I often give is like, either if you want to get into the field broadly, don't be so picky because you get into the field and then you sort of start and you can find your way or find the right company that you're, that you, that you think actually lives those values and the right manager, right? Because that's so key and, and sort of work it in that way. If you can't get a role that says, you know, in the sustainability department. Most of us have created our roles at least, I don't know, three or four different times. Like, oh, that's the job you hired us for? Ah, oh, we're going to do this instead. And we're going to convince you why this is better. I actually think I've only ever applied for one job. <laughs> it's always been about making your own job, right? Um, just to give everyone a resource, and speaking of NGOs, uh, Project Drawdown, which I'm sure hopefully all of you are aware of, is one of the most uh, broad-based scholarly efforts to model 
uh, climate solutions across the globe. They have a new line of work um, called job functions, uh, job function action guides. So if you're in finance, if you're in public policy, if you're in human resources, operations, legal, marketing, here's what you can do. Um, and so I think that sort of crosswalk between the traditional departments of a business and the, the sustainability aspirations of that business is a really good way to get in the door. Um, and you don't have to have sustainability in your title um, to do the work. Awesome. Um, the question for, we we've been touching on ESG, but we haven't gone deep down the rabbit hole on ESG and observation you all have, I think would be important, but there's a specific question that uh, Manisa has, uh, you spoke about interdependencies. There are different players who have ESG standards, including the S&P Dow Jones Index, the World Bank, the UN doing SDG alignment. How important are these players to your work? Are any more or less important? That it's all important, right? I think it's our role and responsibility to sort of take it in and determine two things, right? Of course, what makes sense for, for each business or company, but this field again is moving so rapidly and how are things aligning? Um, and I also think the field of reporting, right, is, is rapidly evolving. Of course, in the more um, formal sense, whether it's SEC reporting, for example, or otherwise, but then how do you manifest perhaps more in the marketing comms way? How do you speak to your different stakeholders and audiences in ways that are absolutely authentic um, and correct, right? With any sort of, um, um, again, I hate to use the term like greenwashing or bluewashing, but without any of that, but but then also, you know, maintain the authenticity of the data and the transparency that you're going for. And I think that companies are, and this is one of the things that I love, there's so much creativity around, yes, you need to get the basics right from a reporting perspective, and that's beautiful. But then how do you um, engage and convey and manifest what you're doing in so many different ways, especially as we've heard today, like what I love about hearing more um, from Eva, Emma and Dave is the, the clear sort of like purpose at the core of why our roles and our teams and the way this work is embedded in the organizations that we serve. And um, I think there's just, there, there's so much happening in this space and it involves so many other team members internally and externally. I'll build off something Dave said, um, which was there's no free money. <laughs> and uh, that's how I think about these, uh, as they're called the alphabet soup of standards and readers and rankers. Um, from a corporate practitioner's standpoint, we could have 31 flavors of reporting and do one thing to report upon or we could have 31 flavors of doing the work and one flavor of reporting. I would love to see more harmonization in terms of what's being asked of companies. I think it's a very nobly, you know, well-intended effort by investors uh, and by governments. But what we're seeing is that, especially because this is such a salient topic, societally, they're feeling pressure either through shareholder resolution or through voters to be turning the crank on business, that doesn't mean invent the 31st flavor of reporting framework. Because actually what that does is creates opportunity cost and the company then probably has to realistically take its foot off the pedal in doing the work and spend more time thinking about how they talk about it and how they slice and dice the same data for different audiences. So others, even on my team, may disagree with me on this, and I invite disagreement, but I really do feel like, unfortunately, it's a bit of a zero-sum game here. And so the more harmonized the outside world can get in terms of what they're asking of us, the more progress they're actually going to see in the things that matter, like decarbonizing our operations or supporting our product and pleasing our consumers. Um, because right now, it is a really time-consuming exercise, even just to understand which standards and regulations are relevant, let alone satisfying those requirements. 
awesome responses. I have, uh, we can probably do two more questions. Um, Mary asked a, a good one, and I'm, I'm actually going to make some comments on it, uh, if I can be so. She asks, or states, curious to know what percentage of sustainability officers are female. I ask because of the gender imbalances across functions of many companies. Um, do they make, uh, you know, how many women on boards of directors of these companies? Do they make a difference in terms of diversity and diversity? And so I'll just give you some stats really quickly because Hydrogen Struggles, we did a uh, a research and mapping exercise not too terribly long ago where, where we looked at the Fortune 500 um, and, and kind of looked on backgrounds in terms of um, uh, diversity uh, as it relates to gender, ethnicity, um, the technical training. There, a recent report from GreenBiz showed that uh, about 20, in, I think in 2011, 28% of chief sustainability officers were women versus in 2021, 54% were women. This represents a 94% increase in the number of women holding this position. Um, you know, interestingly, that gender parity in the role was achieved at a time when uh, you know the role saw this growth to date, which was 2020 and 2021, 20, uh, marking a time when equity and inclusion became a real central part of the conversation on best uh, practice. I will say though, while the, the gender evolution in this space has been pretty notable, I, I also think we need to broaden the conversation around uh, ethnic diversity. Uh, that still lags pretty far behind, but again, the, the stats on um, you know, the gender part gives me hope that we can get there. And it's important, right? We, we, need, we need to have a diverse set of perspectives given climate change impacts all of us. Um, so anyway, I just, I wanted to pose that. And Emma, Anissa, you know, Dave, I'm just any comments that you have around um, gender, diversity, equity, inclusion in this space would be great. I think you gave a good overview of the numbers. Um, maybe I would just comment on diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I think that for me um, and my team, one of the things that we really take to heart is how are we ensuring that in everything we do, um, no matter who, quote unquote, owns at the executive level, DE&I, how are we ensuring that we are being inclusive in our conversations? Um, and how are we Liter it's like putting that post-it of like DEI on your computer to make sure that we're honestly like trying to integrate it into everything that we do and constantly evolving and thinking. So I just wanted to make that comment because DE and I um, sit often sits in different places within companies these days, but but I think quite often also within sort of the the people function. But it's something that I believe that most um, CSOs really also in a very positive way, consider one of their mandates as well, one of our mandates as well. Uh, yeah, I just would, I mean, I would, you know, literally pile onto the feedback that's already out. I mean, the gender diversity, I think, is has literally been night and day compared to what it was, you know, 20 years ago. Um, most of the people on my teams for the last two decades have been women. There's been a few men scattered around, but I mean, just in terms of finding the best talent, and you definitely... You also hit on a point that I do think is kind of the focus of the next 10 or 20 years, and that is racial and cultural diversity. Um, I still think, I mean, I've seen it on the panels I'm speaking on in terms of, you know, just the, the gender mix. Uh, it's shown up everywhere. Um, there's still different, there's still work to be done at board levels. There's still work to be done at, you know, senior levels, C-suites, stuff like that. But the sustainability profession has really grown, you know, to be much more gender, you know, diverse across the board. Final question, and I'll give you time to think about this because I'll, I'll go first, but final question of the panel is um, any final comments or thoughts on what you'd like to see in our field in and around sustainability? Um, I'll just make one comment, which is related to my personal journey. I came and come from uh, a recruiting and central business background. 
And what was incredibly helpful for me was going back to school and getting my master's at Hopkins uh, with a what I thought was going to be on sustainable business. And then I ended up focusing on conservation biology of all things. And it's amazing. You, you'd never think that talking about atmospheric processes or trophic cascades would ever come up in a business conversation, but increasingly it, 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 it does. And having, being able to, I think, speak both languages with, you know, as it relates to capital markets and also on uh, the science side is really important. And my, my, my big observation is I think you need to be able to speak both. You might have a, you know, a major or a spike either on the business side or the science side. And if you're more the business person, uh, you probably need to complement yourself with scientists. And if you're the scientist, it's the inverse, right? You need to be able to be fluent in thinking through how can I communicate effectively with people who haven't spent years in a lab or in the field um, conducting really, really important things. So that's just my two cents. But Emma, Dave, Anissa, any parting wisdom or thoughts to our audience? I would love to see our field stop making the perfect the enemy of the good. I think a lot of people go into this space with all of the best intentions. And we actually, as a field, hold ourselves back. Um, whether it's prescribing to within a fraction of an inch how something gets done or reported or whether it's interpreting the latest IPCC report in such a purest way that it becomes unattainable for any individual organization to map to it. Um, or communicating in jargon that no one understands, but is technically correct. And so I'd actually like us to take the quality bar down a little bit in order for actual near-term progress to be made. And again, I'm guilty of this. I think we all uh, recognize that those who unify uh, a personal interest in sustainability with a professional pursuit do so with the highest of integrity. But we also operate in an economy that is built on fossil fuels and a natural system that is teetering on collapse. And so literally every day matters. And if we are looking out to 2050 or 2100, we're gonna regret not acting today. I'll just say, I'll then we'll let Anissa kind of bring us in for the closing, but I, I agree with, with Emma's point. I think that the, Two things I would say that, you know, if I'm giving people advice and I'll, I'm trying to speak from a business perspective, but this could be if you're going to nonprofit or public policy. I don't think there is any you cannot learn enough about the business you are trying to drive change in. Right. The, the if you ever think you've learned, you know, you, you max out on business acumen like you haven't go back to school again, like. The, if, if we're trying to drive action, right, and action is how we get these things done, you need to know how to, you need to know the levers of decision making, and you need to know how to drive change, and you need to understand human nature, like you need to understand the people you're trying to convince, and what's in their head, and how they think, and how they're motivated, and how they're incentivized, that's one, the other one is the terminology thing, where I, you know, I, I have for years um, railed against whatever term we decided to call this, Right, whether it's corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility, SRI, ESG, sustainability, I challenge everybody I work with. I challenge the company and the leaders that I'm working with today to like. When I hear them use the term ESG, I stop them and say, "Redo the sentence without the acronym. Like, what are we actually talking about? Um, if we could get rid of those two, if we could like amp up business acumen and like get rid of the crutches in the language that we created, it's our fault." I know that I say, but I think that would help. And I would just add, you know, get in there and do it. I think that communications to me, I cannot underscore enough. Like if you're in this space, which again, you can be in this space and work in a variety of departments or fields, but if you can't effectively communicate what you're trying to do or say to different audiences, um, 
or let me frame that more positively. It's important to communicate effectively to those different audiences. Um, I also think that um, what's great is there are so many purpose-driven businesses that are being created. Businesses that have been around forever are finding their purpose, as we know, and just figuring out what you can do in that space is um, time is of the essence. So you don't need the, the, the word sustainability in your title to be making an impact and we need everyone to be all in now. Uh, Anissa, Emma, Dave, a big thank you for joining us today and being our panel. Uh, you were all fantastic and we appreciate your time. We appreciate your focus on helping us transition to more of a sustainable frankly, and also just thank you for jumping into this because you're opening up pathways for a lot of us, including myself. So uh, it's not lost on us that you're going out in the great unknown here. Things are imperfect, Emma, and you're trying to do, uh, you know, really drive things um, to, to create better conclusions for us in terms of people. Um, so thank you. Before we end, I just wanted to thank Johns Hopkins University and the Hopkins at Home team for allowing us the opportunity to have this discussion. And a special thank you to Dr. Jerry Burgess, who uh, kicked us off today for being a huge advocate for the Business of Saving the Planet series. Um, today's panel is the sixth in the series. We had our first episode on creating a sustainable food system in 2019. And very simply, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to air these amazing discussions without the support from Johns Hopkins and Dr. Burgess. If you are an undergraduate at Hopkins, you're doing yourself a major, major disservice by not taking a class with Dr. Burgess. I had three incredible classes with him during my master's pursuits. Very simply, he is one, if not the best professor I've had the honor of learning from. So a quick shout out to Dr. Burgess. And if you liked our panel today, there are four or I should say five more that you can check out. Uh, just go on YouTube and Google Johns Hopkins Business is Saving the Planet. Uh, episode five was investing in our future. Larry, the co-head of Impact Investing for El Catterton, Leah Preston, the head of growth equity from Generation in, uh, Investment Management, a sustainable investment firm founded by former president or former vice president Al Gore. Uh, Priya Prasad Bo, who's the head of ESG at Oak Tree. Episode four was on environmental leadership with Dr. Jane Goodall, uh, Ryan Gellert, the CEO of Gonia, and Lisa Jackson. There's a lot of cool stuff out there. So feel free to just Google us, check out those panels. It's a similar format. And um, we hope to see you again. Again, Emma, Anissa, Dave, Johns Hopkins, Dr. Burgess, Hopkins at Home. My team, Kristen Munoz uh, and Leah Randazzo, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your spring and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much.